Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, the show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. All right, everybody, we got a special episode today. Tees, I'm really excited to have you on the show, man. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And we always like to get the show started with a bit of background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the moment. Yeah. You, you, you want me to take, tell Take it, it um, away. Yeah, no, they, they. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm Tees. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm uh, 41. Time is speeding up so um i still have to get used to Time. to say that age but anyway now yeah I, i'm um, um i studied uh, coastal morphology in delft um started to work uh, as a as an engineering consultant uh, yeah the main project known as the palm tree islands in dubai and that kind of stuff so so that was mainly busy with uh, luckily it, it was a tree but but of, of course just building reclamations and, and building large-scale projects um Started to work five years ago, now a little bit longer, ten years ago for a dredging company. And due to the history of the Netherlands, there are four big dredging companies in the world internationally, um, which are all Dutch spoken, so two Belgian, two Dutch. And I worked for the Belgian ones. And um, yeah, my life completely changed five years ago. My sister started to work with Greenpeace ten years ago or something, and I promised her that I would work with the contractor and try to regreen it. And now it would. Uh, sound like it was a plan but of course that's not how it goes it was pure luckily and of course my interest was with nature um, um, and I was busy a bit with nature based solutions and mainly busy with the aquatic park when I got a phone call from the uh, the area director Malik um, who was a very important person in the project and he gave me a call on 19th of January 2016 and my whole life flipped and I simply just knew what to do and that um a little bit of background they had a little bit of my own a group of people working there in the dredging companies had like the four or five people under me and mainly what we did was developing software in uh, natural complex uh, situations mainly for the workability of our fleet offshore um, and realized that complex numerical models are useless um, um, if you don't know exactly everything you put in there and there already we started to combine some yeah, people tend to call it holistic engineering. So, but we, uh, um, um, every complexity isn't that complex on our, on our own level. So there we were able to provide skippers of the vessels uh, insights on, uh, on workability due to waves in an understandable way and that made money for the company. So doors open at the board and then I got the call and they asked me, um, if we could do something on a fish stock that disappeared from a lagoon. And from there, we just take it away. And it, uh, within two or three months, it, it ended up to this bizarre vision, of which in the beginning, I really didn't want to do it, um, in the sense that we made the whole sketches, we, we bounced very rapidly into the changing of the winds of the Sinai, and, and um, the proper core or hypothesis for that being the main reason for desertification in the world um, but I didn't really feel like the whole intention and stuff and I just want to be myself with my friends and live my life but then Malik convinced me that if we want to do something about uh, the polarization in the world and, and the whole fed up situation uh, which you see everywhere I guess he said dude then, then um, you have to promise me we're gonna do that so he actually convinced me and then we started um, to do it and it was a journey um, which I will never forget. Definitely. And now we're here, five years later, set up the weather makers. Not, not a profit, but a kind of impact driven company. Sure. I, I don't like the word company, but it's just, it's, it's everybody. It's, a, it's kind of a big family, which, which all type of people from all over the world support. Me. And um, um, yeah, we, we were so close um, uh, to start it together with the Egyptians. And then, uh, to finalize that first introduction, um, um, uh, uh, John Lee and I always uh, um, use a little bit the I Ching. Of what? Uh, if we're, if we're oh, what? The I Ching, it's, it's, it's like a, it's, it's, it's a very interesting 
uh, Eastern uh, spiritual yeah, book method. It, it, it tells you something about time and, and it, it keeps you calm not to get crazy about why things don't happen or why people make you a fool or whatever it is. Well, can you explain that a little bit more? What, is it, what does it tell you about time? Well, what is your perspective let me, let me, on time? I can only tell you, Abby, because I have to be careful there because I did I, I did my own way of how to how I have to use it. But the way I use it, and I, I'm I'm a bit of a fan of Terence McKenna. I don't know if you guys know it, but he's I'm from familiar the States, with him. <laughs> I love Terence uh, Terence in the way that he opened up for me. Also, um, what is creativity and what is that thing? And what Terence did, he really digested the Eastern knowledge, which was built up in thousands of years. Of which the I Ching is one of those those books or some methods, but are um, uh, that he very much dive into. And what they actually explain is that time is a linear, but time is a vortex, and, and, and certain things repeats by itself. So the way we in the Western world chopped up DNA in a kind of vortex way, that's how they did it with time. And um, what you can learn from it is you can really start understanding certain processes and get more comfortable on the path you are. That's what it does to me. And, and the I Ching always told me and John Liu, uh, there will be a clear sign. And the moment, of course, we heard, that was a little bit earlier before it was in the news, that we heard that the next call would be in Egypt, would be in Sheikh it would be in the Sinai. We realized that um, the year is to come where we got to drop the plan and um, try to show the people, because I think that's, the bizarre thing about the project is that there are global effects of ecological destruction, but definitely of ecological restoration, which gives hope. And not only gives hope into a way out of climate change or biodiversity loss, but mainly, I guess, or if you ask me, about equality. And that's, that's I guess, what, what for me all comes together there. It's, 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 um, it's life. It's, it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a future perspective. Um, um, which I lost before this came up to us. Yeah. And with it, we now have a whole bunch of in inspirational people around us that supporting it. And we really guess pushing it a bit to the next level. Okay. That's, uh, that's really, that's really it's something. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a yeah. beautiful introduction and it gives me a lot of perspective on who you are and the way that you, you see things. Um, the idea of, of time being cyclical. I don't think anyone could like, conceptualized especially like when you grow up in like america like from the west like nobody yeah I, have you ever seen the film uh mr nobody it's it, don't, 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 it's a european film it's uh i forget the actor but there's this concept in it where like it's all about choices and how time is moving linearly but they do talk about the universe in the sense that what happens when you reach the end of time could you even conceptualize how time could end and this idea that you're talking about i, I don't know i just find that that really really cool because we all feel like yeah, really, really. Was, the reason yeah. choice is so important is because you can't go back and people have these regrets because they feel like they make bad decisions Decisions. But if you kind of live in the moment and enjoy every single second, I don't know. I could, yeah, I mean, we just don't, there's, we know so much less than we don't know. And I feel like the way you can under, you can operate in the world the best is by trying to grapple with the idea of not understanding much. But what you can take time to understand is yourself. And that's how I think most of the people I talk to who are doing these amazing projects spent a lot of time trying to figure out who they are and what they want to be. And then they spend all their time on this, this one thing to, to help the world. So that's pretty cool. C can you explain exactly what it is that the Weather Makers Project is doing? What's like the goal or the mission behind it? because you kind of talked about the origin but like what exactly is it uh, yeah yeah Ooh. it's always this question is always interesting the, the, the thing is i guess what what, what the weather mics tries to do is a is a real opportunity in this world that keeps on uh polarizing more and more and pushing everybody further away from each other is to generate a real opportunity for the local people in the sinai and for the egyptians to um, say what I guess their indigenous knowledge always said. It's um, the future of humanity is in the history of, uh, of Egyptian knowledge. Um, um, so what we're trying to do is, 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 is create an opportunity to re-green the Sinai for the local people with the support 
um, of the the, the um, yeah the, 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 the construction capabilities um, of many of the instruction the destructive industries which are out there right now, whether it's the dredging industry or the oil industry or other things, and it's definitely not um, a greenwashing, and it's a big big discussion now after copper. 26, what we're trying to show is um, climate change in the short term and in the long term um, can be beaten the best by ecological restoration, where ecological restoration does not only sequester carbon or other greenhouse gases or brings water back into uh, the soils, which create rivers to flow, which creates agriculture, which creates food, which creates the foundation for peace. Um, but it also uh, stabilizes the, the free fall of which our biodiversity is in. <coughs> and I guess the good thing about it is, is that whatever you do with ecological restoration feeds the people that live on the land and doesn't feed a single person or whatever it is. And lots of the things you now see the world is doing for climate change. And luckily, finally, the awareness is there. Um, but what we discovered purely by coincidence and um, not a scared mind. In other words, uh, a mind, um, and it's not one person, but it are many persons now. There are hundreds of people that work on it. Is really look in a different way to uh, what history has to tell us. You can look at sailing routes, at, at trading routes, at, at, uh, at the caves of settlements of, 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 of minerals. There's so much stories that tell us that climate change has not started with industrial uh, uh, civilizations or the industrial revolution. Of course not. It started way before. It started way before it. It was the way when agriculture became big. But if that's the case, it means to say, with the current capabilities we have, what happened in the Lus Plateau, in many respects, for the World Bank in that sense, and China. <laughs> yeah, we definitely need to talk about that. Well, what's very interesting is is you're not saying let's green the Sinai Peninsula. You're saying let's re-green the Sinai Peninsula, which is at this point it's a it's a desert, right? I mean, that's it's, it's like pretty much well known as that. And as long as you and I have been alive, it's always it's been a desert. But the point the point that you're kind of getting at is we have this idea that humans are causing climate change. We're causing the climate to go, to warm. We're increasing CO2 levels, which is creating this positive feedback loop of killing things and increasing temperatures even more so but the climate you know this holocene that we've been in for the past 16,000 years or whatever has been the most stable climate period uh, of the recent hundred thousands if not millions of years and then I mean there's a lot of interesting stuff being discovered when it comes to what's it called the uh, the period between 11,600 years ago and 12,800 years ago where there's like a theory that there was like a uh, ast some sort of cosmic impact that that changed the climate shortly and like all, all the stuff going on in Egypt as well with the pyramids and the Sphinx and the Sphinx has like water what is it it has like erosion from water on it and it's just like like you're saying there is a lot of evidence that the climate is always changing but now we have enough technology and intellect to actually pioneer those changes so this is a question do we want to use it to suck up all the resources today and then just become you know fat rich kings who just suck the land out or do we want to become true stewards of the land and you know uh, create more life which i think is it's very readily obvious that we can do that so the question is how and i think that that's kind of what you're working on is like turning an area that used to be full of life and bringing it back in if you guys can successfully do this i think it'll be a groundbreaking project let me, let me try to add on that do a little it. bit though, because i like that, that is without a presentation but I guess what I learned from Mian Mian, which is an amazing metallurgical scientist who was in the lead for the European of, um, uh, Union for 25 years, but nobody want to listen to him because everybody just want to build and do their own stuff. Um, what he learned me is that you have certain continental divides. And very simply, these are mountains high enough to separate weather systems. It's six degrees per 1,000 meters. With, if your mountain range reaches up to more than 2,000 meters, it can separate weather systems. So it can separate the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. And what, when I started to digest this work well, and, and, and looked at the vision or the story that came up with it, um, with one of the most sacred places in the world, the Sinai, we realized there used to be a continental divide on that Sinai. So there used to be a mountain range high enough to separate weather systems. 
But these weather systems um, there was the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. And due to the, her location um, on planet, if she is broken, she could very much cause like a leak in, in the whole Mediterranean and catchment basin. And that's why it became, she became a desert. What, we're, what we realized, that if you fix, and somebody, some people used to call it aquapuncture points on this planet. Are there aquapuncture points on the planet? Yes, there are. And for sure, the, the things we destroyed. And if, we, um, if, if you cure a patient in a hospital, you start searching for where she, why she's ill. It doesn't mean to say that the whole desert needs to be regreened or other places, that we need to restore ecological function. Not only trees, there's much more to do. The swamps, the, the the animals, everybody, everybody is a weatherman. Totally, um, and, and that's what we that we that we just purely by instinct bounced into. And for me, being a, ch- a child from from uh, metrolized hippies, <laughs> um, I never was that close to religion. But many of the people around us now in the story, if if if, if you have the guts to start reading the fake books and the old text, you all see it. It's in there. It's in the Quran. It's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. So what it actually does? What is it, there? These you, the, the idea of this inflection, these inflection points, or what exactly are you talking about? The, 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 <laughs> I always there. I have to be careful because it's our, it's not my um, faith. Sure. I, I do, due to due to the um, uh, the project, I have lots of respect of it because I understand it's it's part of law. But it's the Quran that says it's he who fertilizes his winds and builds up heavy clouds and with fruit make it come down above the be- dead land. So what you see, is, and, and it's in, in the Bible, it's, it's he who split the rock that created um, water to flow down like rivers. It was Mian Mian that told me it's not a human, it's the tree that breaks the rock. It's not oh, damn, that makes a bit sense. And if you start seeing it, and that's what I learned from the Chinese when I was with the Lusbato, with Li Rei, it's that in their culture, in the Asian culture, they are much more focused on, on their past. And for some mm-hmm. reason, we in the Western world, or for sure in the Netherlands, or my education, uh, I always have to be careful here not to step on any tennis, <laughs> um, that, I, that, that I, I was always busy with the formula that can solve it all. But the formula is out there. It's, it's, it's back. It's not in the future. We have to learn. The land will tell us. And the sailing routes, and I'm a sailor, in the sailing routes, you can see when that Sinai fell and completely flipped um, the whole climate engine of the Mediterranean and Indian Basin. And it took only 100 to 200 years to decertify um, the Sahara. But that can never only, that cannot happen by a meteorite or by a, a wobble in the axis of the world. That's the current explanation in science. But it's weird, 35 million years ago, Africa bounced into Euroasia. She already became a desert twice. With other words, she already regreened once. So why don't we look at and why do we accept that this whole world, 25% is a desert and there are heat factories. And yes, they reflect more heat into uh, outer space. Absolutely true. But they create much more heat and they push out weather systems. Why do we accept it? Why do I, what I don't understand is if I hear people saying that we are with too many people on this planet. I don't agree. It's not up to me, luckily, to decide how many people can sure. be here. But we're not going to change our behavior as a species to say, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot do this. No. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? If, if, if we, there's more in, in, instead of less. Climate change, it, 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 it's a massive, beautiful opportunity. It's the biggest, if we in capitalism want to call it industry, I don't care how you call it. It's the biggest driver which we're going to have for, for the upcoming thousand years. It, it, it's, it, it's an amazing future perspective we now have. I, and that makes it like I, I couldn't agree more. Why, why don't we uh, kind of go into what you learned in your yeah. time in China in the, in the Luas Hotel so we can give people some actual practical examples that they can, instead yeah. of just thinking about like what we could be, mm-hmm. like this really has been done and within our lifetime, an area that was completely desertified yeah. has been completely regreened. So can you just kind of tell me? Green, an area now of the size of France. Huh? Now that, it's that and big. For, yeah, for your viewers already just to trigger you, this is what I normally say also. <laughs> They're doing it. They're doing it countrywide. In China. In China, they're they're regreening massively. What? And I, I when I was with John Liu, like it was 2016 June or something, 
got into the plane. I met John Lee once, showed him the whole presentation, what I did on, on, on the Sinai that I could turn the winds. Normally, everybody would call me crazy. And this man just gave me a hug and said, you will be the best friend of my life. And I said, the first thing I need to do, you you need to have, you have to come over to China. And um, I did. Flew into Beijing, flew into Xinjiang, got a car, drove up to him for seven days. For just fucking seven days to an area where you could still see certain slides, sides of the hill. Very steep and completely arid. <coughs> but not a majority of the land was green. You had wild nature. You had people. And I think that was made the most impact on me and never forget walking up with John Liu through this, this, this slippy road. And he met people that still knew him from making 25 years of documentary. How did you connect with him? It, uh, the, there was a, I saw that there was, the, um, um, I'm just not called re green. Uh, there was a, the backlight documentary regreening the deserts i think you can easily find it on youtube by john lee um and he um i was there and, and the, well, it's a funny story i was actually just working right i was a technical manager on a big construction site and i was doing some other stuff and then this just popped into my life and i called all my clients and said listen i'm not going coming to site the coming weeks i have to do something because i think i can i don't know help a bit maybe uh, humanity humanity um, and they said, uh, whatever, dude, but uh, okay, they, they like me, so they give me a bit of time. And then at a certain moment, I wasn't um, that much on my projects. So the technical manager from Rijkswaardstaat, the Dutch government, called me and he said, dude, I really need to speak to you. I know everything goes well, but uh, you, uh, right, we pay you guys, so why don't you come over? So he came over and he said, you really have to watch Green Gold. That's what it's called. Green Gold, backlight, documentary, John Lee, about the whole restoration of Elizabeth. And I didn't want to do it. Um, but a friend of mine or friends were cooking for me and supporting me a bit because I was a little bit uh, mental in, in the ID. And then um, my friend put it on. I watched it 35 times. <laughs> I need to speak to this guy because John Leo actually asks in this movie, we need to do this worldwide and we need to scale it up. And anybody who knows it, uh, what to do, just give me a call. So I gave Common Land, it's the Dutch organization he, he, he works for. I kept them calling and calling and calling, but it did, they didn't answer because they were busy because lots of the people wanted to do a regreen. And at a certain moment, I got them on the phone. I said, listen, I either now drive up to Amsterdam and burst into your office, or you're just going to connect me through to Willem Farida, the, the director. And that's what they then did. And then he said, okay, come over in six weeks to my place, um, uh, to the office. And I came in there, and we prepared 22 reports, little reports of what we were doing, a full presentation with the whole team. And they were like completely flabbergasted. And when I came in, John Lee was there. Oh. And since then, John Lee really, really uh, gave me a deep dive because I wasn't an ecologist. I didn't know shit. <laughs> I, got, I got passion. I got, I, got, I got a drive. And I knew the capabilities of this dredging industry. So with him, we traveled for seven days. And it's, it, it's just so... I realized in, in, in my whole life, and I was lucky to travel around the world quite a lot, but it made me, mainly, it made me sad. And it also made me always come back to the Netherlands and thought, oh, no, no, this is the place I want to be, mainly mm -hmm. because this was already so destroyed that you didn't see that much devastation anymore. But when I was in the Lisbeth it was the first time that you saw nature kicking in and coming back. And the funny thing is, because I never was there before, I couldn't see it on the trees, but I could see it in the people. They were proud people, people loving their culture, people loving their food, people loving themselves, and people just in, in peace and in inspiration of, of the environment that was changing. And that just, just blew me away. And next to John Liu that kept on talking to me for seven days, like, dude. And, 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 hey, man, you banged down his door. Still... You, you were asking for it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, no, no, I'm still, and, and, and we're still very close in that sense. And I guess there, and he took me to Lire, really the guy that, that started the whole restoration of the Lisbeth. And I come in there with my Excel on my computer and my whole deck Amazing. of slides. And he, and he was just, dude, go for it. This is it. You're right. And, every, and you don't know exactly everything. And that's the funny thing about the Lisbeth. The World Bank came in, China wanted to do something on a very um, uh, poor part of their country 
and Lire simplified it with three little things they want to change. Poverty control of the region, food security of China, and sediment control of the Yellow River. Well, and dude, that blew it away, man. 80% of the sediments are not in the Yellow River anymore, which doesn't cause flooding and many uh, uh, killings of the people by the flooding. Uh, the average weight of it is now 60 million people went up three to four times. So, so everybody that starts an argument about the positive effects of ecological restoration on the economy is just a fool and just really have to look into the numbers because it's not only there. There are many, many other examples. Not this size, but there are many examples. Um, and, and the whole food security, man, it's, it's, it's the fruit basket now of China. So if you just be there, it's, it's, it blows you up. What did they do to get this to happen? Well, I guess also in Green Gold, Jeff Loughton said it, but Lee Ray can, can say it also beautifully. It's damn simple. Retain moisture. Retain, <laughs> Retain moisture. moisture on the mountains. And of course, it, 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 I now say it easy. And so it means to build build little dams to stop the moisture, to be able to uh, seep into the soil. Uh, by increasing the, the retention, you increase the infiltration. John Liu beautifully captured it, and I normally like to combine John Liu and Miami. Yeah. Percentage of biomass determines the percentage of organic matter, determines the infiltration of water, determines the sequestering um, of greenhouse gases or call it ecological growth, and, and canopy development in, in more different levels, uh, increases the recycling of the moisture, so you don't need that much external moisture, but you, you can recycle it normally in, in a proper functioning watershed three to five times easily. And with that, you just cool down your earth surfaces. And, and Mian Mian wrote it for the for the European Union. They didn't want to listen at that moment. Water badges water. Our soil is the womb. And vegetation is the midwater. Many people now uh, uh, talk about carbon dioxide, which is beautifully, don't get me wrong. It, 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 it's, it, it, it's, it's logically, and, and it's amazing how that research popped up and saw there was a problem. But the answer for climate change is not carbon dioxide, it's water. We have to much more focus on regenerating water cycles. <coughs> what I normally tend to say is that we never fly up to the moon or to another planet or search for, what do we search for? We search for water. Water is the main principle for life. And we need to understand how we can infiltrate and retain moisture. And that's what the Chinese did. And they were lucky. Yes, it was maybe two to 250 mils of rain a year. Yes, they had lots of fertile soils, which is cobblers. But dude, it was a barren land. And if you now walk out there, man, you get the waterfalls, you get the stuff coming back. And it's much more productive than it ever used to be. Right. That's it, it's amazing for anyone who isn't aware of this. They should really check it out. Um, can we let, let's Absolutely. get into talking about your plan for Lake? What is it? How do you pronounce it? Bard Bardwheel and the peninsula and you, how, how you're yeah. going to start stimulating this this water. I don't know. It's it's like a positive feedback loop. You were you were describing like the more water that comes in, the more moisture that can be held, which can hold more water, which can create more moisture, if, if I'm understanding it correctly. Yeah. Well, first of all, any impersonations, um, double check it if I say it because I'm, I'm very strong dyslexia. So okay. um, uh, normally the people around me would say, don't ask these how to say <laughs> something. But anyway, I could, um, we call it Lake by the Wheel. Uh, and Lake by the Wheel is um, uh, situated at uh, the northern side of the Sinai Peninsula, which is approximately 60,000 square kilometers, uh, which is uh, on the south attached to uh, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba and uh, the Gulf of Suez, the Gulf. And on the northern part, she's attached to the Mediterranean. And there's this lagoon, um, or they call it the lagoon, and it's a bit of a discussion. If you ask me, it used to be the old outflow of the Red Sea <coughs> more than 10,000 years ago. Um, uh, and now it's, it's a very hypersaline lagoon um, with two artificial inlets towards the Mediterranean. Uh, and she's only approximately 1.5 meters deep. Um, and that's not normal for a lagoon. I'm a morphologist, and if you see it, and you look at the tidal prism, and there's not that much tidal prism on the Mediterranean in an elevation, maximum 55 centimeters, approximately. But on that surface area of 600 square kilometers, there's quite a lot of volume of water coming in and out. But if that system is dying off, she uh, siltates, and it goes away. 
but she's very, um, uh, uh, she's like a, a fish nursery. But she's getting hypersaline due to the climate change and, and the lack of uh, flushing with the Mediterranean. And um, the plan is there to, first of all, restore the lagoon. Because what we, again, not realized, but by, by luck bounced into is, is uh, the potential of aquatic ecosystems, which is massively, they can very quickly start producing food. Uh, not only that, they're attached to the, the Mediterranean biodiversity. So if you're stabilizing the temperatures by increasing the flushing of the tides, how do you do that? Open up the doors to the Mediterranean. So the whole concept is, is that we uh, create tidal inlets or which more flushing in the lagoon comes. This stabilizes the temperatures, it reduces the salinity, and it, uh, it, 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 in, um, it lets spiral flows, so 3D kind of yeah, spiral flows enter the lake, which they will steer up the sediments from the bottom, push them up um, towards the upper part of the column, the secchi depth for, for um, detailed people, but it's just the, the top four meters. Where algae can grow, they are mainly diatoms, the phytoplankton types. It's the baby milk for the aquatic ecosystem, and then the whole ecosystem can start up. And we do that by dredging inlets and reuse all the sands we dredged. So the inlet we dredge we create kind of sand engines to capture even more tidal energy to to push into the lake, and we we generate internal gullies in the lagoon to connect um, and internal reduce the what? friction. So more internal gullies, tidal gullies. So it's um, channels, but then naturally made. Um, and by doing it, um, uh, you really rapidly reduce the high salinity part. And now it's so saline that the whole ecosystem is is on our knees, right? She's, she's ready to die off. But um, uh, rather quickly we can, um, and, and the question is how quick we have to do it, but we will learn from it. We will do it step by step. Um, we can bring back Alive into it, but if we do it, we also need to dredge the goodies. And with the goodies, we start to dredge sapka. And sapka are just very fertile sediments because if everybody has to realize, and I guess sometimes, if you start to search for answers, your starting point is very important. And me as a morphologist, um, never saw salt as a problem because salt is a natural flocculate, right? So if organic materials come into the lagoon and it's a salty environment, the salt flocculates with it and then it can settle it's down. It's called the Dead Sea so for, for a reason, you know? Yeah, the, 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 the Dead Sea is very sold, of course, <laughs> but not definitely. So, so the subgas, um, um, uh, the sediments are very, very fertile. They're only lacking really of, of phosphor, but for the rest they have everything. So by dredging the gullies, we can start restoring the wetlands. The wetlands are important for the nurseries, for the whole lagoon, are important to reduce the turbidity uh, of the waters, the stirred up sediments will trickle down in, in the salt grasses, uh, the halophytes, get onto the banks, um, break down by bacterial and microbial activities, and the nutrients are freed up for the phytoplankton and the silica, which the remineralization of, of the mudflats. And then, and then you get the funky part. But not only that, the wetlands are the first evaporation machines you need in a watershed. <laughs> and Miami Am beautifully showed that in Spain. So what we started to realize is, 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 is by just simply optimizing the first work of the lagoon, we were very much increasing the available water vapor into that desert. What is in, inflatable step, water vapor? What does that mean? Well, we are starting to increase um, uh, uh, the water vapor uh, into the watershed. Uh, sorry, maybe I uh, used the uh, wrong no words. Um, um, but, 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 but the wetlands are just crucial part um, uh, for it. Again, it's also a funny thing because what it does, um, the Sinai, and Google it for, the, for your listeners, really Google it. The Sinai used to be the biggest migrating birth route of the planet. But that helps us. That makes things more simple. I always have to think of Jeff Loughton, a known permaculture person, telling that in, in the documentary of John Lee. What we need to do remains relatively simple. It's hard work, but the choices are just damn easy. In these sediments, there are indigenous sediments, right? They are the eroded soils 
uh, from when she used to be green. Uh, and there are still indigenous microbial communities in these settlements. We got the settlements. We started just to plant seeds. Everybody told us nothing will grow in it. We started to place seeds in it and shit started to grow. So there what we realized that if we can attract again the birds that are very much flying around there, they will bring the seeds. They will, they will build up the new biodiversity, which is robust. I normally you don't use to call it ecological restoration because we're not going to restore which was out there because we're way too late. We, we fucked it up. So we destroyed. <laughs> what we can do is regenerate the natural ecological function. And that's what we do. So the wetlands will attract the birds. So we'll bring in that new biodiversity. They will increase the water vapor. And then the next step is um, um, desalinating these fertile sediments. And, uh, uh, reforest the highlands to capture the moisture and then start ecologically restore the whole place what the chinese did um, uh, and and they showed us um, the steps to take after that well it so that's a bit well it's amazing it's it's a really interesting concept the idea being that it's like life was very spread out circumstances changed and it seemed to you're making this not this claim, but there's this idea that the seeds for all the life is lying dormant in the bottom of the lake. It's all collected in there. And if you can like spread out this really fertile soil, you can, and, and where, where is the water going to come from? We're not going to spread it out. Uh, we're not going to spread it out. The, the, the image I told you when I had to say I'm still in construction. Uh, we, we're building these uh, for local people, these, these eco ways, yeah, really that. based upon the work based upon the work of John Todd. What John Todd did, which, which and everybody needs to Google him as well. He, he's, a, he's my Jedi, um, together with some others, but he's an amazing guy. What he already did from the 60s, he built eco-machines. He built aquatic food webs to either purify water, harvest nutrients, and connect them also to land, terrestrial ecosystems. And if you do it, you start to understand that that all builds uh, functions, right? And if you really want to create a, a cycle in, in agriculture or other things, we got to look at, uh, at agriculture, um, cattle, aquaculture, and our own households. This is what all the indigenous people do. So by creating um, a salt water uh, aquatic food web, we can produce fresh water if you put a dome around it, or later on, whatever shape it might be, it might be a greenhouse, whatever it is. And um, you can uh, use the water um, um, as an energy buffer uh, and if the sun comes up in the greenhouse he evaporates the salt water so fresh water is evaporated you can condensate it from that we can build a brackish food aquatic food web and step by step we can desalinate the soils and build a more fresh aquatic ecosystem and that's and that's uh, a three uh, the, uh, and, and a fresh uh, uh, terrestrial uh, uh, soils and, and trees etc so there what we're doing is the main infrastructure will be really supported by functional biospheres, so soils, plants, etc. Yeah. And yeah. later on, of course, you can still uh, think about spreading out um, um, the sediments. But of course, the sediments are in the beginning salt. So you've got to be very careful not to pollute your surroundings with the salt. Um, uh, but <coughs> if you want to do it on a large scale, um, and for sure, if you want to regreen the desert, the problem of the desert and the difference compared to the Lus Plateau is that we don't have soils, right? So the majority of the soils we need to bring there. Now look into the mining industry. I used to work for quite a lot in that sense. They all do it hydrology. So what we realize is if we're dredging in the lagoon, energy-wise, so just let go of everything, right? Think about your head, trying to find a solution. How can I get soils up into those mountains? A very easy way is just transporting them hydrology. Looking at the sediments, we saw we were only lacking of phosphor of which the seawater st still holds low concentrations, but phosphor. So what we realized is that if we would build a, a salty aquatic food web high in the mountains, so we will pump it up with pipelines, but on a low density to avoid uh, a large maintenance costs of the pipelines, we would pump it up there, take the salty water um, through an aquatic food web, where all the nutrients are har harvested by phytoplankton, by uh, microalgae, etc., and being processed towards fish, which you can harvest. So it's not only you eat, the people that are going to live there have a very diverse food plasma. 
And if the salt then goes a little bit salter, flows out to the system, we keep it into a settlement pond. Let it further evaporate moisture because salt water, isotope 18, needs more energy to evaporate, but uh, condensates on a lower level. So it's very interesting to do ecological restoration with a water vapor with a high salty footprint. And if you have that salty water still in the mountain, you let her flow back to the ocean, get the energy out of it and use that to pump it up again. So really on an energetic scale, it's a very wise thing to use seawater um, yeah. as an energy buffer, but as a transport medium. And by doing that, you can really start looking differently at large-scale ecological restoration, where again, the industry supports local communities to do this. So it's the local people that have to do it. And I learned that myself as well. I just planted a tiny forest here in my own garden. And it's, it's work. It's yeah. love. You've got to give them love. Yeah. It, it's, it's people work. And um, um, so I don't really myself don't believe in, in very industrial ways of revegetation because it's got to be people have to do it. Uh, and the law has got to be put in there. But the resources brought to the place can definitely be done with industrial capability. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, so how, why are you or how are you getting permission to do this in Egypt if you're from the Netherlands? Do you have a, a partnership with the, with the local government? No, that's also that's also how things um, um, go. I now have a partnership uh, uh, with Egypt. I, um, 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 it was their question. They asked uh, uh, Malik Bukabush, who was the area director of, of, of Deme um, in Egypt, of the Belgium Dredging Company. And they asked him, don't you, um, you, you guys did an amazing job on dredging the Suez uh, Canal. Can't you do anything um, for the future perspective of Egypt to do something about by the wheel? Because we want to further um, create more stable future for Egypt. Um, and he called me and, uh, well, that, that's when the spark went over and I guess the whole project started. And since then, there's something special. Um, in the beginning, whenever I told this to, to uh, universities or scientists, people were making fun of us on the scale, on the stuff. Because, oh, show me in a computer model. I said, oh, fuck the computer models. Look at here, the trading routes. Look at what it was also the whole <coughs> argumentation has always been very holistic. But the moment I, uh, we were uh, requested on, um, on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the presidential palace in Egypt, uh, John Tal, John Lee, where the people went with me, they never challenged it. They realized for them, the Sinai is a special place, it's a sacred place, literally, for the Egyptians. And it's the Egyptian history that holds the country together. And I learned myself not to judge. I don't judge on what people did. I judge on what they do to support the outcome. So lots of the people ask me, uh, uh, can you work with those people? Well, I normally always tell them, please look at your own country or your own government, your own companies, whatever we do. Um, I don't believe that people are much worse in that sense. And on the other thing, I don't judge people on what they did before. It's easy. That's not how we get out of the, the mess we're in. Um, 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 and that's how we started to do it. And, 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 and um, um, yeah, and now we build up a very strong relation with the Egyptians. But don't, but bear in mind, and that's what I learned from John Leo, ecological restoration, it, 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 it touches all the people out there. So you, it's a long, long process. Um, uh, yeah. But the ball is rolling, and they love it. No, I, I, I suspect so. Let's let's go back a, a little bit to this idea of like these um, acupuncture points that you had spoken about, yep. um, and why why you're so interested in the uh, the Sinai Peninsula to begin with, um, because yep. it has this proposed effect that you think that it's this focal point that can change the whole climate system by reorienting the, um, the wind patterns, right? And that's, that's another reason why you're specifically very interested in regreening this part of the world? Yep, absolutely. So what's, what's going on there? Yeah, 
Uh, okay, let me. It's, it's always interesting now not to do it with with um, with a presentation. I mean, we could put we could put it up. No, no, but but if you don't, I, I like the challenge. I like that. If you look at um, um, the whole world is being divided in engagement basins, right? An engagement basin normally means to say that you got a you got an ocean or a big lake, but normally you got an ocean. And you got the whole lands, and you got the continental divide. So again. The mountains high enough to separate weather systems simply because of their elevation it gets so cool that all the moisture falls out and it's the moisture that determines your wind patterns you can see it with sailing you can see it with with the Volvo ocean race and uh, moisture and winds are all connected to each other if a land doesn't have <laughs> any moist in her no groundwater tables, no soil moisture, anything. If the sun comes up, no vegetation. If the sun comes up, she heats up the land. She heats up the land. The majority of, of the solar energy is transferred into thermal flows. The thermal flow normally means it creates a low pressure on the land. And that low pressure then sucks in the sea breeze. Now, if you look carefully on that Sinai, there are a couple of important factors you have to realize. You get the Mediterranean, you get a relatively small piece of land reaching out to 2,700 meters, the continental divide. Next to it again, you have a north-south orientated Red Sea, and then you got this massive Indian Ocean basin. And what the Sinai is, she's the most complete, smallest watershed in the world. So she has a shore, and she has... <coughs> a continental divide and that watershed is approximately only 35,000 square kilometers um, which flows into the Mediterranean now if you understand that vegetation harvested and infiltrates moisture and if that vegetation is gone there is no moisture so the sun heats up, so you create a massive low pressure and you create a suction of this air. But this suction of air, which starts from the Mediterranean, heats up by the desert, doesn't reach your condensation level anymore, point. So your relative humidity, instead of going down or up, so she reaches your dew point, she goes up. So yeah, she goes, the relative humidity goes down. So so you don't reach the rain point and all of that moist, which still is normally in the Mediterranean, 66 per two thirds of your moisture is evaporated on the ocean. So you start with a relative humidity of 70%. Your evapotranspiration on the desert picks it up um, to 100%. And due to that evapotranspiration, the air remains cool and you get your rain. If the rain droplets falls, the drag force turns the wind. So that's how you create a water cycle. If that's broken, you generate a massive airflow with moist from the Mediterranean into the Indian Ocean, which causes, and afterwards it became much worse by the whole desert, but it really triggers that first suction of moist out of the Mediterranean basin and caused the Sahara to turn into a desert. And that moist, not being in North Africa, is already a problem, but if you just follow her, that moisture is being via the Red Sea injected in the Indian Ocean, where she creates um, the nursery for bad weather systems throughout all southern, eastern Asia. And a very strong point here is what we tend to make. We set up a full scientific data processed group, because the models cannot handle this skill, is that by regreening the Sinai, you uh, start the right point to restore <coughs> the watershed uh, of the Nile and the Mediterranean to so Southern Europe, Northern Africa. So you keep the moist in her same body so you can start regreening her. And with that, you very rapidly start reducing the bad weather systems in Southern East and Asia. And, um, and then you can just read back history. It will be the Levant winds that again penetrate from the Indian Ocean back into Europe, and which um, causes, not only brings biodiversity, of which we still know that in India, Constantinople, many of the plants originated from the Indian Ocean, but we forgot how it came. It's the wind. 
the answer is blowing in the wind, my friend. And that's, I guess, what we realized and, and that we, um, we bounced into again. It's not that we were searching for this point. This point came upon us and we, um, the evidence is just building up very strong. And that means to say that do we need to regreen every part of the world? Absolutely. You're good, man. You can say whatever you want. Yeah, we got to do it everywhere. The same in the Netherlands. We are a green desert. We got to do it everywhere. But are there points we can focus and bring our industrial capabilities to it? Oh, fuck yeah. If we got companies like Shell or Chevron or these people that now are mainly busy with uh, uh, destroying it, it remembers me, I, I did two or three years ago, um, an amazing holiday in Alaska. And I traveled uh, uh, for several hours next to the Pruha uh, pipeline from Pruha uh -huh. Bay down south. So we can do that. It's not difficult. We know that we got the knowledge. We got the stupid capabilities. Why don't we implement it? And the funny thing is, I've spoken with Shell on the highest level. We spoke to a couple of oil. Uh, they want it. It's not that people sometimes tend to forget that the system we created, I believe that everybody is good. And I believe that everybody doesn't want what's actually happened. Um, um, and many of those people are willing um, to step in there. And if we do that, we can... So if we focus a bit, and that's our pitch, <coughs> if we focus our capability, and if there are aquapuncture points, which is not only climate-based, because it's the cradle of Muslim religion, it's the cradle of Jewism, of the Old Testament, of the New Testament. It's the most sacred place on this planet. And I can tell you one thing. If you read it, if you read those face texts, they're love, they're the connection. They're not one story, but together they're one story. It brings up us on the spiritual level also together. And I guess that's what we got to do because it's stupid Yeah, what's happening stupid that we are mainly just looking at Europe. We're on, oh, we got refugees coming from Africa. Sometimes we're even our European Commission, and I'm saying that as a bit of the elder in societies in this current civilization, I call America a bit of a teenager, and you got the young child popping up, China. Yep. And, our, and, and the answer of Europe is, no, let's shoot down the boats. But come on, the fucking people. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the same. We, we cannot say... And don't get me wrong, it's not that we can handle more refugees. <clears throat> so we need to change our future perspective. Why don't we change it radically? Use that the destructive industry of which the Netherlands has a lot. We're very good at pumping up oil and the offshore industries. Why don't just give it a new purpose? Bring it out there and give it more time for the Western world, but China as well, to... Uh, change our societies in a more fossil free things but already now start reducing the carbon impact but the water impact all of it by restoring ecology with our industry support these people marshall plan that's how you the foundation of peace and why don't we think about a global climate plan and a peace plan and then man i'm, I'm going to put on the television again and watch the news because maybe there's Good some stuff. happy stuff Passing by them, yeah. man. I, I I absolutely love your perspective. It's it's it really vibes with me. It's it's um, it's really interesting for me to consider talking to all these different people, and then specifically now talking to someone like you. That I so I I knock doors in Boulder all the time. So I meet people us in Boulder. You know, we can be very different and very similar in many different in many other ways. But there are people who fundamentally believe that we don't have the capabilities to change our environment. And then I talk to you who's literally explaining the exact mechanisms and how they work and how there's these different focal points that we can use to totally create. And I, I'm, I'm totally on, on board with you. I also, not only is even if it wasn't demonstrably possible based on science that we have today, I believe that human capabilities are, are fundamentally unlimited and we're capable of accomplishing anything. So when someone says that I don't think we can influence the, cl the climate, I don't get into arguments with people, but it's just, it's really interesting to me when I talk to all sorts of different people who know how all these different systems work, but it's really cool. So, so with that being said, since it's clear that we do have this ability to, to influence these ecosystems and make them better, more, more, more able to produce life, how do you think we can create these incentives 
um, to use this power to promote like good rather than just sheer, like you were talking about, the oil industry deriving profit. I, I agree with you. I think there are pe- these people behind these businesses. They're not just soulless, you know, people who want to just make money. Like they all at our core, we're all, you know, the same, like you said. But how can we create like large scale incentives to act- actually make, make this happen and happen uh, sooner rather than later, you know? Uh, <laughs> Um, what normally happens when people are um, let me respond to one thing first Um, what normally happens when people are whether it's uh, um, um, climate induced um, um, or what is it again people induced climate people um, um, fucked up the climate yeah if people they they talk about oh no no we we didn't cause the desertification it was a natural process uh, it could well be that if we destroy a little part, the impact could be much bigger. I normally uh, refer to that beautiful story of Yellowstone Park, where rivers uh, or wolves could change rivers or can actually build rivers. Now I normally say, well, what do you mean to say? You're more stupid than a wolf or what else? And it's funny, right? So there's so many evidence. It's the beaver. There's so many animals that do it. <laughs> and people tend to digest that and understand it more easily. So what I normally can do is just mirror them with, with, with animal lives and um, then they normally open up already a little bit for the discussion. Sure. If you're going to ask me um, uh, uh, um, how I think we can trigger humanity uh, to do it, uh, I am again going to be a little bit careful because it's not up to me. I can just do my yeah. my, my, my best um, uh, and trying to change it. And if I had the answer, I would already have... Uh, started to regreen the Sinai, so I'm also still in that process with many of the people around it. But of course, I can, I, I can give you my opinion. Um, well, the first, the first thing I think is, and that's why uh, Tim Flannery, who wrote the book The Watermakers, what we called our company uh, after, is that um, for us the Watermaker stands for humanity. Whenever we became a bit of a populated species, we change the weather. If you change the water conditions of land. You're a weather maker. <coughs> so the basic principle is that everybody can make weather. Everybody can pull out their piles in their gardens and let water infiltrate and put vegetation in there and be a weather maker. And I guess that's what I learned from Terrace McKenna and internet. Internet now has a lot of negative things, but of course also has some beautiful things. She can bring back um, and show what together we can do. Realize that um, um, if you look back at the carbon dioxide levels, uh, certain pandemics are shown in the carbon dioxide levels. With other words, it's a little bit um, um, the connection towards COVID now. I guess that's what it is. Like, uh, the other thing, what I was going to say, that, that, that uh, what I always found funny is that lots of the people indeed say, oh, no, we cannot change and, and we're so bad, etc., etc." If you look back at history, the whole reason why we're the dominant species is because we're the adapter kings. Exactly. Not because we're smarter, not because they're stronger. No, we're gossiping and we're, we can adapt. We can do this. It's not that difficult. We did it way before. And yes, we're now in, in, in a global threat, but we have so many... Uh, species threats on uh, is is well. So let's not be afraid. Let's enjoy the challenge we have and do it now. And then the last thing, I guess, <coughs> let us of course not let go of carbon and uh, let us uh, uh, use equivalent carbon. How you can very easily uh, um, uh, connect it to natural productivity, biodiversity. For me, is a whole solar battery. Um, of an ecosystem, right? The, the higher the biodiversity, the, the more plant life, animal life, everything there. I just see that as a as a battery of, of solar energy. So we used to have the phrase uh, absorb more solar energy uh, um, and, and to give it to future generations to come. So um, um, what I think we should do is take the weather, not the climate, the weather um, as our main goal uh, because it's easy, it's close by, you, you can if you change your water conditions, you're gonna change that whole thing. And we call it an ecological value stacking. So what we tend to do <coughs> is um, um, we, I think what we need is a common dealer in all of these crises, and that's just energy. And energy in an organic form. 
uh, it's the sequestering, it's solar energy, it's gravitational energy. And what we what we do, and it's a bit difficult now to fully explain, but hopefully within two weeks, the whole uh, website is uh, for BIOS um, um, change and, and we have a proper definition there. You can look at it, you can add to it because whatever we will do from next year, we will go fully open source. Awesome. And everybody can see it. I think um, um, there's this image how uh, ecological the ecological pyramid can be shown. You, you can show her in population, uh, so that you have the, the trophic levels, you have the different complexity of lives, of which we are on top. We are part of it. It's our family. So let us treat our family as we uh, uh, treat ourselves. But it's explained in, in, in numbers, in biomass, and in energy. And in the energy format, it really allows you to see <clears throat> ecological function as weather, as biodiversity, as biomass, as carbon credits. And we call that ecological value stacking. And I think that could be a way, but there are many other ways, uh, but it, it could be a way. For me, the most important driver to put the trigger out is we're not with too many people. We're with two less people. We could a hell of a job what we got to do. Uh, and if we treat all the problems at one and start to understand that how Darwin drew evolution, that's where we in. We, we specialized ourselves. We went out. We, 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 we got all of our knowledge out there. And now we need to not make things more complex, but we need to simplify. We need to bring back stuff together and push for the next level. And yes, if you ask me, ecological restoration and regeneration on a large scale <coughs> will be the change um, as big as fire used to be for our species because it gives us the ability um, um, to really uh, maybe take a step into space later on. But um, it brings us together. And I think that's um, 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 the main goal is. I had lots of discussions with John Liu um, and he always told me about tease if your money system is based upon gold, you need to mine it, destroy ecosystems so the people that used to live there get hungry, so they need money to buy the food, and you actually increase that money system. If you restore ecological uh, function, you sequester all of the greenhouse gases. With other words, if you put the value on the function of an ecosystem, you create abundance. So you take out uh, inequality, you take out many of these things. So I think the first step we should take is equalize emissions of greenhouse gases towards the sequestering of greenhouse gases. Really make the cycle, because then we all start to realize we forgot the power of our planet, of nature. And she is way more stronger than any windmill or solar panels. I'm not going to bounce them. I got some solar panels, I got some windmills. They're part of the transition, but they are not the solution. It's ecological restoration. We gotta restore our family and enjoy her. Tease, it, it's been amazing talking to you, man. I, I hope everyone <laughs> enjoyed hearing your perspective because because I certainly did. It, uh, I, I I I agree so much. I I, I it's so cool because I started off knowing nothing about. I just came in with the idea: how am I going to help people? Climate change that affects everyone. Okay, I'll focus on that so I can help everyone equally. And you know, there was like, okay, yeah, get the solar panels and the wind going. And as I've gotten deeper into how can we really become stewards of the planet, this idea of restoration just it like vibes with the innards of my soul. And I love the idea of making things like it's life is not. I mean, life is very complex, but the answers are, are more simple than, than someone might realize. You just have to have the strength to actually uh, actually do it. And I think that's echoed in a lot of the religious texts as well. I was at the end here. I'd love to ask people, um, you would love to know what advice you have for other like innovators that want to like reach really high and, and achieve like a big, awesome project. Any just final thoughts on that? I always have to get used to people. Um, um, <laughs> Well, I, I think my main answer is follow your um, um, have the guts to follow your intuition and put your hands in the soil and the water and, and feel nature and nature will support you on the, on the path you're at and realize that I guess what I've learned and maybe that's good to uh, to say as well from from a, a pretty secured life uh, uh, in the dredging industry but an empty soul 
five years ago with two friends, we made the, the decision to start at the Wedemakers. And I never one second doubted that decision. Not that I was, of course, at certain points, missing a bit of the security or your salaries or other things, but it was just life and love surrounded. And what I realized, whether it's Mia Mia and John Todd, John Liu, Lire, all of these people, they are there to support you in this journey. And that counts for me as well. So everybody that, that listens to you and really jumps into it. And it doesn't matter the size. I always say in Excel, the Sinai is as big as my garden. Um, um, and I mean it. It doesn't matter the size what you're doing. It, it means the compassion you feel, the ability to open up your intuition and to share it with other people. And um, I guess all of the people in the restoration are, 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 are there for you to support. And just, if you want to do it, take up the guts, give them a call. I got, uh, you can you can find my contacts on the internet. That's how we, I, I'm now hearing your show. So just reach out. And then uh, I, I guess... That's a beautiful thing. Let us connect and, 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 and enjoy it. Amen. Better get used to that question, man. Young generation's coming up, and they're going to be looking at you because what you're doing is really amazing, and I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. It's been, uh, it's been a real joy. Thanks a lot. All right. You're welcome. Thanks. All right, everybody, and we will see you soon. Take it easy. Cheers. Bye-bye. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.